Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're looking at a brand new monitor from Philips, a bit of a follow on from my review of their 43 inch beast on the channel a few weeks ago. But unlike that display, which is, I guess it's impractical for most users, the 32 inch model I'm reviewing today makes a bit more sense for the average gamer. This model is so new that for now, in what is, I guess, a rare feat, uh, it seems to only be selling in Australia, though I suspect Philips will push it out to more regions shortly. In any case, the monitor is the 328M6FJRMB which is an absolutely atrocious name for a product. It's especially terrible because there is only a one letter difference between this monitor and another monitor from Philips. See that R in the product name, the third last letter? Yeah, that's what separates this monitor from an older version released back in 2017. It's pretty crazy, right? The R basically means this new monitor is HDR capable with Display HDR 400 certification. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment because the term HDR appears to have been used loosely, but the key problem is the ridiculous product name that makes it nearly impossible for buyers to distinguish the FJRMB model from the older FJMB. Seriously, Phillips, this is a terrible product name. Please fix it. Anyway, so this is a 32 inch 1800R curved 2560 by 1440 monitor with a maximum 144 hertz refresh rate with FreeSync support. For the monitor nerds out there, it uses a Samsung VA panel with a TPV backlight unit, which is the exact same unit used in the AOC AG322 QCX. I believe this panel is also used in several other popular monitors with similar specs like the Viotech GN32LD I reviewed on the channel previously, along with the new Samsung JG50. In terms of pricing, this Philips model is the most expensive out of that bunch at $600 Aussie, which makes it $20 more than the AOC model and $40 more than the new Samsung model. The JG50 is actually a great price in the US right now, just $360 US dollars, while the AOC model is almost $100 more. And it's pretty interesting to compare the two regions right now in terms of pricing. I suspect this Philips unit will slot in around $400 US if it makes it to the States. This particular panel has had a long life and has been progressively getting cheaper, which is why I suspect we continue to see new product launches, including this Philips unit and the new Samsung JG50. The AG322 QCX launched for around $430 back in 2017, and before that we had the popular Samsung CHG70 with a display HDR600 capable backlight at a higher $600 price. However, as you might note, the AG322 QCX is not an HDR display, yet this Philips monitor is, and both use the exact same display unit. That's rather suspicious if you ask me, and is a bit of a precursor to our HDR performance evaluation. Anyway, first let's look at the design, and it's a pretty decent one from Philips, with slim bezels around three sides of the display, and a simple black plastic construction on the rear, though there are some large glossy sections that might annoy some of you. The stand is a reasonably attractive V-shaped metal design, which is sturdy and supports both tilt and height adjustment, though there's no swiveling, and understandably you can't pivot this curved display into a portrait orientation. The on-screen display is controlled through a directional toggle and it includes, well, basically the same features as the Momentum 43. Like its larger 43-inch brother, you still get ambi-glow lighting along the bottom edge, which is an RGB strip that mimics whatever content is currently on the screen for a pleasant ambient lighting effect that's best suited to dark rooms with white walls and furniture. It works quite well if you're into that sort of thing, though it does come disabled by default. For inputs, we have two DisplayPort 1.2 ports, an HDMI 1.4 and an HDMI 2.0 port, along with VGA. Some people will complain about the 1800R curvature to this display. It is now possible to get a flat variant with these specs in monitors from LG and Pixio, so that might be more up the alley of the curved display haters but some people like the curve. It's a personal preference thing, and for me, I could go either way at 32 inches. One thing that irritates me about this display is that it's advertised as HDR capable and even comes with Display HDR 400 certification. I really don't like using this word if I don't have to, but in my eyes, 
This certification is a lie from what I observed in testing. Not only does this display fail to deliver a true HDR experience, it also fails some of the key metrics that are required for Display HDR 400 certification, which leaves me questioning how Philips even managed to get it certified by Visa. I've mentioned it in the past how I think Display HDR 400 is far too loose of a spec for HDR content as well. As you can see from my HDR monitor checklist, in theory this display only passes a handful of items, namely sustained brightness and 10-bit processing. None of the three key HDR pillars, which are color space, brightness and contrast, are properly addressed. In particular, the complete lack of local dimming means we aren't getting anywhere near an appropriate contrast ratio for HDR content, even though this is a VA display. However, Philips specs for this monitor are not accurate whatsoever. While Philips is claiming a 400 nit peak brightness level, I only achieved 240 nits at best, whether I was in the SDR or HDR modes. So not only is the peak brightness level unsuitable for HDR, but so is the sustained brightness level. So I'll have to add another cross to my HDR checklist. Brightness accuracy is also quite poor. It seems the panel has been calibrated thinking it can do 400 nits because when you request 320 nits of brightness, it doesn't even run at its full 240 nit capability. With that said, I can add a tick to the checklist because the monitor supports 92% DCI-P3 coverage, which is a little higher than 120% sRGB. Anything above 90% DCI-P3 is suitable for HDR, and I suspect Philips was being a bit conservative with their color space figures in their spec sheet. So you are at least getting one pillar to HDR, and that's wider than SDR color space, but it still completely fails on brightness and contrast. So this monitor simply is not HDR compliant. It cannot properly display HDR content, so it shouldn't be advertised as HDR compatible. This is especially bad as Philips has specifically produced this new model with HDR support in mind to replace an older similar model that does not have the feature. I also think Philips should not advertise the monitor as display HDR 400 compliant, not just because the monitor cannot display HDR and buyers might you know, get confused into thinking display HDR 400 means decent HDR. I guess that's a completely separate issue with the display HDR tiers, but it's actually because it fails the display HDR 400 performance metrics. See the white luminance performance target that's required for the 400 tier? Well, the Momentum 32 can't hit any of these brightness targets, so it isn't compliant with the spec. Now, maybe I just received a bad monitor and some units actually can produce 160 nits more brightness than my model can to meet the spec, but let's be honest, Philips, if only some monitors you ship can hit the specifications listed on your box, are those specs really accurate to begin with? Let's move on from HDR testing for now because there's still hope that the Momentum 32 is a decent panel for regular SDR content. After all, it's mostly competing with SDR panels, so if it can deliver a good experience here, it might still be worthy of a recommendation. In terms of response times, we're looking at a typical VA panel here. Philips lists a five millisecond greater grade transition time, though in my testing, the actual figure is more like 8.05 milliseconds on average. This is using the faster overdrive setting, the second fastest Philips provides with the top setting introducing overshoot. I suspect Philips five millisecond metric comes from either the minimum transition time, which is actually closer to four milliseconds, or perhaps they use the fastest overdrive mode. In any case, eight milliseconds is more around the mark. If you look at the charts, you'll see the Momentum 32 performs almost exactly on par with the Viotech GN32LD, a monitor with similar specs and presumably the same Samsung VA panel. While the overdrive algorithms are different for each monitor, of course, the average overall, average rise, and average fall times for the Philips and Viotech models are less than one millisecond apart. So it's always nice to see two monitors you expect to perform the same perform roughly the same in practice. However, while eight millisecond response times are typical for a VA panel, it's on the slow end of the scale, and this is an inherent limitation of VA technology. While you do get great black levels, the panel is slow to respond. Unfortunately, it means this display is not a true 144Hz monitor. 144Hz monitors have a refresh window of 6.94 milliseconds, but the Philips Momentum 32 transitions on average in 8.05 milliseconds. So we're effectively being bottlenecked by pixel response to around 120 hertz. In other words, smearing, ghosting, and overall clarity from this 144 hertz VA will be similar to other 120 hertz displays. The good news is input lag is fantastic. The Momentum 32 is one of the fastest displays I've reviewed with lag in the three millisecond range. This is in stark contrast to the much slower Momentum 43. 
I guess the Momentum 32 being more of a gaming focused product means they've used a gaming grade scaler and the results definitely show. However, it all falls apart a bit for Philips when looking at color performance. Out of the box, this monitor is wildly inaccurate. White balance is absolutely crazy at 5347K, and there is a strong red tint to whites, which is immediately noticeable and will annoy anyone who purchases this monitor. On top of that, color gamut is completely uncapped, so when viewing standard sRGB imagery, which forms basically everything on your PC, you'll be getting severe oversaturation, and this explains why Delta E averages across the board are so bad. On top of this, we're still facing weak brightness of around 240 nits and surprisingly low contrast for a VA panel of just 2100 to 1 or thereabouts. This is similar to the Viotech GN32LD and AOC AG322QCX, so again, we're looking at the same panel. That said, AOC correctly lists a 2000 to 1 contrast ratio in their spec sheet, while Philips lists 3000 to 1, which is well above what it can actually achieve. Fixing the color performance issues is difficult. Uh, Philips does provide an sRGB mode, which clamps the display to sRGB, but its attempt at fixing the white balance isn't much better than the default mode, and in the sRGB mode, you are locked out of the user white balance controls. Alternatively, you can correct the white balance yourself, but then gamut remains unclamped, so everything is oversaturated. This really isn't a great place to be in, unless you have a hardware calibration tool, which I guess only a very small minority of buyers will have access to. Naturally, of course, it is possible to get near accurate performance with a software ICC profile generated with SpectraCal's CalMAN 5, though there's still a bit of wonkiness, I guess, to grayscale performance. A combination of OSD tweaks and this profile does deliver proper sRGB accurate performance, though, and I guess the one benefit to a wide gamut monitor like this is if you have a calibration tool, you could create a profile for DCI-P3 or Adobe RGB though these are software side profiles and won't be supported in every application. If your Momentum 32 is strongly tinted red like mine was and you want sRGB accuracy, I recommend trying the display profile we created for this monitor. You can get access to that when you sign up to our Patreon page, links in the description. Final piece of the performance puzzle is uniformity, and here we have typical results for a curved display. The center section of the display is reasonably accurate, but the outer edges are not great, like most panels with an 1800R curve of this size. So it seems pretty clear that Philips has attempted to create a more premium 32-inch 1440p 144Hz product with the Momentum 32 because it's priced higher than similar competing monitors like the AOC AG322QCX and the Samsung JG50. The feature that was supposed to differentiate this monitor and justify the higher price tag is HDR with Display HDR 400 compliance. But this display actually delivers a poor HDR experience and isn't even Display HDR 400 compliant as evidenced by our standard monitor tests. When you factor in the issues with default color performance, namely the seeming lack of any calibration at the factory, and I really don't see any reason to purchase this display over the AOC or Samsung options. The Samsung JG50 is at a particularly awesome price right now at either 360 US dollars or 560 Aussie. So my recommendation would tentatively go to that monitor, though I do hope to re fully review it in the next few months. That's not to say every aspect of the monitor is bad. Input lag is fantastic. Those with hardware calibration tools have the option of creating a wide gamut profile considering you are getting nearly full Adobe RGB coverage. And the design is pretty great. Plus I still think 1440p 144Hz is the optimal setup for monitor specs for gamers. But the value proposition just isn't there right now and I really don't like Philips lying about HDR support. That's it for this review. I suspect I might be getting an email from Philips after this review goes up, and I wonder if they'll send out any more monitors to review. So in case they blacklist me, consider supporting us on Patreon so we can just buy their monitors ourselves in the future. Subscribe for more monitor reviews. Give this a like if you liked it, and I'll catch you in the next one.